Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you here. My name's Lou Bilionis. I'm the Dean at the College of Law, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Um, today is uh, September 17th. It's also Constitution Day in the United States. It, it was on a Monday, actually, in 1787, 226 years ago now, when, um, when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, uh, having spent four months in Philadelphia, uh, four hot months in Philadelphia, a long hot summer, um, concluded their work. And one by one, 38 members of the uh, delegation walked to the front of the room to sign the Constitution. Uh, George Washington was there. Uh, he was the president of the convention, and he signed his name at the top of the document. Um, and then in geographical order, starting with New Hampshire, everyone there who was willing to sign did so. Uh, only three who were there withheld their signatures. And the convention, you may recall, um, met in secret. With the work done, the news finally could be released. And someone asked Benjamin Franklin outside the hall, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And Franklin responded, a republic if you can keep it. And we have kept it. We've kept it for 226 years now. And with events like this today here and around the country, we're stopping to reflect on that achievement. And I'm glad that we can do that together today. Um, the Constitution Day that we're celebrating is really a public, a public experience, a public occasion, because the Constitution itself is a public document. Um, there isn't anyone in this room who doesn't in some way make an appeal to it, to turn to it, uh, to make it one's own in one's own way, to find in it uh, some affirmation of your vision of what this country is about. Um, and uh, throughout the years, people of all ages and stripes have made recourse to it in water coolers and uh, water, water cooler conversations and bar rooms and street corner debates and talk radio, call-in shows, you name it. Uh, it has sustained our civic discourse uh, for generations. And it's good that we're going to be able to continue that today. And um, we have uh, many people to thank, but I do want to thank um, uh, Lewis Katz, our graduate who's here today. Thanks to his generosity, uh, we have here at the College of Law the Alfred B. Katz Constitution Day Fund, an endowment established by Lewis Katz to honor his father, Alfred, who also was a graduate of the uh, College of Law here and was born, yes, on Constitution Day in 1911, and we're honored uh, to have uh, the support of that endowment each and every year for this occasion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Katz uh, was one who loved his country dearly and believed in the American dream, and we can't think of a more fitting way to honor his uh, memory here today. Now, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Marcy Hamilton, who holds the Paul, Paul Verkyle Chair in Public Law at Yeshiva University's Benjamin and Cardozo School of Law. Professor Hamilton is one of our country's leading scholars on the relationship between religion and the state under the Constitution. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Law, where she was editor-in-chief of the Law Review and once a law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor at the US Supreme Court, Professor Hamilton is the author of dozens of scholarly works on the religion clauses of the First Amendment and their proper application to a changing American landscape. She's been in the forefront, not just with her scholarship, but also as a prominent public voice on the ever-varying controversies pertaining to religion and the law that emerge in our nation. When those controversies arise, as they have in the area of, for instance, legislative efforts to exempt religion from otherwise generally applicable laws, Marcy Hamilton could be heard as a clear and forceful voice so too, when clergy sex abuse scandals called into question the fairness of statutes of limitation and other devices that hinder abuse victims from seeking justice, again, Marcy Hamilton stepped forward as one of the earliest advocates in favor of legislative reforms. She served as constitutional law counsel in many important religious land use and clergy sex abuse cases and is frequently asked to advise state legislatures and Congress on the constitutionality of pending legislation and to consult in cases involving important constitutional issues. These themes figure prominently in two books that Professor Hamilton has authored. 
one called Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children, and also the award-winning God versus the Gavel, Religion and the Rule of Law. She's been a bi-monthly columnist on these and other legal issues for more than a decade and maintains a cutting-edge website on child sex abuse statutes of limitations in all 50 states. Last year, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where she resides, honored her as one of Pennsylvania's Women of the Year. It wasn't a bad year for Professor Hamilton. She also received from the National Crime Victims Bar Association their Frank Carrington Champion of Civil Justice Award. I know her students at Cardoza would want you to know that they have on many occasions honored her as well uh, for her uh, accomplishments as a classroom teacher. Today, she's going to ask us to reflect on how the framers of the Constitution recognize that those who hold power are always tempted to abuse it and thus implemented devices to keep power separate and in check. Uh, friends, please uh, give a warm Cincinnati welcome to Marcy Hamilton. Thanks so much to uh, Dean Bilionis and to Lewis Katz for sponsoring this event uh, and to all of you for coming. Uh, on the way over here, I was in the taxi and uh, the, the taxi driver asked me, you know, what was the event that I was here for? And I said, Constitution Day. Uh, and that was followed by dead silence. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know it's important. Uh, we're, we're still working on uh, the rest of the country. So let me just start by setting something aside so that we can get to the real heart of why the Constitution matters the most, uh, in my view, and why it's been successful as, as much as it has been. The Constitution was not drafted by demigods. There are historians who have been fond of saying such a thing. But the framers themselves would reject that sort of a concept. In fact, it was drafted and ratified by fallible men. And in fact, the genius of the American Constitution is the built-in presumption, the acute awareness of the fallibility of human beings. The draft eventually that was sent over to Congress was sent with some consternation by some of the framers. They weren't sure it was going to work, as, uh, as you heard the dean mention with uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, some were very, very concerned, like Madison, whether or not there would be men good enough to fulfill the goals of the Constitution. You know, it's one thing to create a system. It's another thing to know and could be concerned about whether there were people that would get into that system and make it a good plan. Notice that they built in an amendment process. They knew from the beginning it was going to be inadequate, that it would have to be amended. Uh, and finally, uh, when the Bill of Rights was drafted, the Federalist, Madison, Wilson, the two most brilliant men at the uh, convention, they were certain that no human could ever list all the rights that could possibly be, exist. And so they had to have the assumption you would have to add more rights or assume that rights were intended that hadn't been included. So let's start from the proposition that we're going to assume that every human is fallible and then add to that proposition we must assume that anyone holding power is likely to try to abuse it. Anyone holding power is likely to try to abuse it. Where did that come from, right? Why would that be the basis of the United States Constitution? And of course, it came from complete failure, right? Our first Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, was a failure. Right? You know, law professors like to jump all over the world to emerging democracies and deliver the United States Constitution, explain how great it is. Um, but the truth is, we didn't do it right the first time. And we almost lost a union and ended up more like Europe with 13 states because the Articles of Confederation failed. Under the Articles, what happened 
is that the fear of uh, an overarching monarchical power led them to institute 13 countries, essentially. Uh, the, con the Congress that was in place for the, under the Articles was not unifying. Why did it fall apart? It's because they wouldn't work together, the states. Right? They were asked to send money for common defense for an army. Ah, forget that. They didn't need to do that because nobody could make them send the money. They each undercut each other while they were trying to uh, trade cotton with England. So we started out a failure, but we ended up with a much better document that has proven to be not perfect, but strong. And the basis is the assumption that everyone holding power will abuse it. And this principle came from essentially Calvinism, Presbyterianism. It's the one claim to fame the Presbyterians have in American history. I'm Presbyterian, I know. Uh, and so here's what happened. John Witherspoon, the Reverend John Witherspoon, was the president and the primary teacher at the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University. And at the College of New Jersey, he lectured on the formation of government. And here was his lecture. He said, government is created for a people. So no one government is transferable to outside of a country necessarily. What you do is you experiment. Here are the building blocks of government. There's direct democracy, there's representative democracy, there's monarchy. But even amongst those, there's different types of representative democracy. There are different types of monarchies. So the idea that was taught to James Madison, who himself said he was prescribed a strong dose of Calvinism by John Witherspoon, was that government making is just experimental. And that really was, in that era, that was the concept. So if you combine failure, the sense of failure, with this sense of, well, it's experimental, being created by uh, fallible men, you can see what was going on at the convention pretty, pretty clearly. They were experimenting. What if we have three presidents or five presidents? Let's have a committee of presidents because we don't trust, trust any one individual to be in control. Yeah, but that's not really going to work. Let, let's make the legislature the slower body. And so eventually they came out with a product which they thought was the best they could do. Right? It was the best they could do. Not perfect. And they were hoping that the gaps that they knew were in there would be filled in by either good people or good fortune. That was pretty much what they uh, thought they would have. So there was no platonic form for a constitution. Right? You know, the platonic form that's up there and then you match reality and then it must be good. None of that. Experimental, assumption it's going to fail, and the, excuse me, the need for amendment. So what's the tool that you use to create this possibility of avoiding tyranny if you know that everybody's going to abuse their power? And what they came with was the idea that you separate power. So all of you I know have heard of the separation of powers of the federal government. That's the most obvious, three branches. It was already being done in the states. It was translated into the national government. So. Uh, that one's pretty obvious. The second separation of power that they instituted was the power between the federal government and the states as co-sovereigns. Very innovative. The concept you would have 13 sovereigns and a national sovereign, not tried before. The idea was that the states would hold primary lawmaking power over almost all law and the federal government would get a narrow slice of power. Uh, and if any of you doubt this assumption of the abuse of power and the likelihood that anybody holding power 
will want to expand their power. Just look at what Congress thinks it can do now. Uh, and finally, the single most innovative part of the Constitution, by far, is the separation of church and state. The notion that the government could be distinct from the ruling clergy was the single most innovative part of the United States Constitution, and interestingly, the part of the United States Constitution that has been least replicated by other countries. It's very rare to find a country in the world that actually has a vital separation of church and state concept. But that is the innovation that the framers had. Why? Well, if you go back to the convention, religion was only mentioned three times for the whole convention. Right? One, they decided there could be no religious testo. Anybody serving the government would not have to swear fealty to this god or that god, this bishop, or that preacher. That's the one substantive religious element that's in the main body of the Constitution. Then there were two other comments. One, Madison said, one of the things he was really concerned about was that uh, the government should not be able to disenfranchise people based on their religion in the way that England had. England had denied the vote if you were Catholic or Protestant, depending on the era, and that was of primary concern. So he was concerned about the overweening power of religion. And then finally, uh, there was a day when it was really hot and they weren't making any progress. And one of them said, you know, maybe we need a chaplain to open up our proceedings each morning. Maybe a prayer would kind of get us together and it would, it would be a good way to operate. And then uh, they looked around and said, is anybody willing to pay for a chaplain? Uh, no. Uh, and that was the end of it. So, so no, no religion at the Constitutional Convention uh, in the sense of thinking that religion was going to be the, the way in which this Constitution was going to operate. Instead, what they were drawing on was the long history of classical representation in democracy and a concept derived from Presbyterianism but in no need of theological basis that you just don't trust anybody who has power. So let me take you through several contemporary examples where we see that this pitting of power against power and separating power is at work and working because this is really uh, the testament to our Constitution, uh, that we have a system of deep divide among people and among legislators, but we have a peaceful country. Uh, you know, that's a really remarkable thing. So how are we doing this, given that we are the most powerful country in the world uh, in a lot of different ways, why, why, why haven't we had more civil wars? Why aren't we fighting more? So let's start with the federal separation of powers. So the most recent example is that uh, President Barack Obama uh, had drawn a line in the sand, right? And he had said to Syria, no chemical weapons. And if you use chemical weapons, we plan to take action. And wouldn't you know it, Assad, used chemical weapons. So we have established the chemical weapons were used. We have a president in the world stage saying we're coming after you. He now starts trying to uh, mobilize the military to be able to attack. And his first position is we're just going to go and attack. I won't send any boots on the ground, but we're going to attack. Then what happens? Well, first of all, CNN has to do a poll, and it looks like it may not be a great idea. But forget <laughs> CNN. Then what happens is Congress says, what? Uh, no, we're kind of weary with war. And one of the most interesting moments is when we see 
far left and far right members of Congress joining together for press conferences saying, not on my time. This is not happening. And so now, you started with a president, a line in the sand, his reputation and legacy at stake, and Congress says to him, not a good idea. Nah, that's not what we're going to do. And then you get the back and forth. You get the uh, Department of State, you get John Kerry saying, we have to do this on behalf of the president. You get members of Congress saying, uh, no, still not persuaded. And what do we end up with? In a dictatorship, there would have been, in all likelihood, an immediate attack without conversation, right? In this separation of powers, what you end up with is Congress pulling the president back from the brink. All of a sudden, there's a diplomatic solution. And the diplomatic solution is now that uh, they're going to give up their chemical weapons. Uh, and until they don't, uh, there's a stalemate between Congress and the president on whether there should be an attack. But the president continues to hold in the background, I will attack. Congress holds him back. And so for now, we have this equilibrium. Right? In another system, that would not have worked out the way that it did. And so for you know, our purposes today, uh, that's really the, um, the least controversial example I've got. So let's talk about gay marriage. All right. So let's talk about federalism. Massachusetts was the first state, Massachusetts Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, as they like to be called, declared that gay marriage was unconstitutional under the state constitution, that uh, no gay marriage was unconstitutional under the state constitution's equal protection clause. So they were the first state, Massachusetts was the first state, to recognize gay marriage. Well, Congress immediately reacted. Uh, and think about this. If Congress held power over all arenas of the law, like they sometimes think they do, but if they did, what would have been the response, given the makeup of Congress at the time, to Massachusetts? The response would have been a federal law that said that the only legitimate marriage is a marriage between a man and a woman. And there would have been 50 states having to toe the line for what Congress said. But Congress understood that marriage law has belonged to the states from the beginning and still belongs to the states. So they only had two options, and both options were floated. First was the option of a constitutional amendment, right? You needed a constitutional amendment to take the power away from the states, give it to the federal government, and then uh, set up a uh, marriage regime or a constitutional amendment that would say that regardless of what the relationship is between the federal governments and the states, one man, one woman. So that was introduced, but of course, getting an amendment through was virtually impossible, and so uh, everybody knew that was kind of a political moment, but it was a concession by the federal government that they couldn't mandate gay marriage. So then what, what, what did they have? Well, they enact the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA. And DOMA has several provisions. One of them is that no federal agency will provide, uh, will acknowledge the existence of gay marriages. And another provision provides that no state has to uh, observe or, or honor marriages from other states. The Supreme Court just decided in the Windsor case that that first provision regarding federal uh, uh, benefits was unconstitutional. Now, what was the reasoning in Windsor? The reasoning was federalism. 
Now, the case came down on due process grounds for lack of equality between uh, gay couples and uh, heterosexual couples, but the rhetoric of the opinion and the internal logic of the opinion is all about state sovereignty over and against federal sovereignty. What went wrong with DOMA, according to the court, was that the federal government was interfering with the state sovereignty over the definition of marriage. And but for that distinction between who has power over marriage, DOMA may well have been constitutional. That's really a remarkable development that we remembered that there was a distinction between the federal government and the states, and the states do in fact own something of power. I mean, the history of Congress is that it has accreted to itself as much power as it possibly could at any moment. And it has decided that it is competent to rule on any issue. Uh, so that federalism was, had disappeared up until the 90s. Finally, the court remembered that there is this separation of power between the federal government and the states. And originally, federalism was treated by largely, you know, extremely liberal law professors as being the end of civil rights. It was the end of civil rights. I will never forget, I was at uh, NYU Law School for a, a symposium that uh, it was actually a seminar that you'd go weekly and talk about constitutional issues, et cetera. And the Supreme Court had reached its first decision saying that it was reviving federalism, states' rights, in the Lopez decision. And the Supreme Court had held unconstitutional the Gun Free School Zones Act, saying that it was beyond Congress's power. And at the beginning of the talk, which was not on federalism, but at the beginning of the talk, the two law professors that were running the, the seminar said, the Supreme Court today has decided to abandon civil rights. So we'd like to have a moment of silence for the disaster that's being visited on us. And my idiotic colleagues from around the city were silent. Uh, I'm sitting there going, it's federalism. I believe it's in the Constitution. You may not like it, but it's definitely in the Constitution. And it turns out that federalism actually is a separation of power, not a rights preference. So with gay marriage, it's because the power is in the states and not the federal government that gay marriage has made the progress it has in the states. We now have 13 states with gay marriage uh, with all expectations that that number is going to go up. Had Congress had the power to enact the law that it wanted to enact in response to Massachusetts, there would now be a federal law that said no gay marriage, and that would have been the end of it, you would have had to have repealed a federal law in order to have gay marriage. So it is a structural element of the Constitution, states' rights. It is not anything about rights. It's about separating power so that there is more power to go around. Uh, and that's really one of the most uh, salutary effects of the law that uh, the Constitution creates. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the separation of church and state. So this is the third arena where we have separation of power. Now, when I teach our Con Law 1 course, that's our structure course. I include the Establishment Clause as part of the structure of the Constitution. When I teach con law to our rights course, that's when I teach the free exercise clause because that's a rights based. But the establishment clause is a structural part of the Constitution 
intended to increase liberty by keeping the two most powerful aspects of human existence at some distance, and that is religion and the state. When religion is married with the state, that is when tyranny has its most opportunities. Just look around the world. When it is separated somehow, I mean, there's no such thing as, you know, a, a scientific separation between church and state, especially in the United States where over 80% are believers. You can't, you can't move religion and the state into separate containers and say you can't talk to each other. Uh, but what you can do is have a Supreme Court that draws boundary lines between church and state and keeps either from dominating the other and keeps them from forming a unity that will then oppress others. And that's the success of the Establishment Clause doctrine in the United States. And I would put at the feet of the Establishment Clause the reason we have peace rather than religious civil war. I would also put the interpretation of the Free Exercise Clause at the Supreme Court, but that's a different speech. So the question is, uh, how do you know where to draw the boundary line between church and state? Given you can't create this hermetically sealed separation, but you fear complete unity, it's all about line drawing. But all of constitutional law is about line drawing, right? There are no more confusing cases to students than the separation of powers cases, right? You look at a few of them and they think they've got their footing and you look at a few more and they're like, what, that, that doesn't, what? That's not the principle we were talking about. Why is it that these separation of powers issues are so hard to diagram mathematically? The reason is because power is plastic. Power expands to fill whatever space that it can find. And so when the court draws this boundary line between the federal government and the states, or between th two branches, or between church and state, both sides go back to their corners and try to figure out how to get over the line. That is the history of the United States. The president looks for unitary power. Congress looks to disable the president. The court looks to find ways to explain why the president has stepped over the line. It's all about the assumption that if you have power, you're going to try to expand it. So if you're going to try to expand it, what that means is there's no stasis in this system. It's constantly developing. So once the Supreme Court says to Congress, you can't do this, that doesn't mean Congress says, oh, thank you. Yeah, we, we've decided we're going to be a limited branch, right? So I litigated uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the Supreme Court. The court says it's unconstitutional because it's a violation of federalism. It's unconstitutional because it is a violation of the separation of powers. And by the way, it violates Article V's amendment procedures. Three reasons it was unconstitutional. It took about two months for Congress to have a new bill up that would replicate RIFRA on the theory that the court couldn't be serious. So the, the idea that uh, we're dealing with a structural provision is, is that everybody holding power is going to try to abuse it. And so you can always expect some movement on both sides. And that is nowhere as true uh, anywhere in the constitutional scheme as it is with respect to the Establishment Clause. Now, you know, contrast this to Equal Protection Doctrine or the Free Exercise Doctrine, where really what you've got now is a machinery for deciding cases under levels of scrutiny. Just figure out if it's strict scrutiny or if it's intermediate or if it's rationality review. Once you figure that out, you've got your facts, you run them through your level of scrutiny analysis, and there's an answer, much cleaner. On the Establishment Clause side, the court is constantly asked, 
which one overstepped, the government or the religious organization. So there was a law in Massachusetts, and the law said that uh, you can't have bars when, within a certain few feet of a church if the church doesn't want it. Right? If the church doesn't want it. That was the rule. So in other words, a bar could locate next to a church if the church wanted the bar next to it. But if the church didn't want the bar next to it, it couldn't locate there. And so a challenge was brought to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, that's unconstitutional. Why? Because it's the religious leaders who are deciding what the law is. You can't have the pastor of a church deciding a land use issue for the public. So we can't mix up the roles, right? There's the public role, and there's the religious role, and they're quite distinctive. But at the same time, we have a whole host of other issues that come up. So can you have a crush on the front steps of a courthouse or inside a courthouse? Can you have the Ten Commandments in a courthouse or in a school? Uh, can you have a mixed decorative theme of candy canes, reindeer, uh, crash, and a menorah? Right? All of these questions come up, and the court is constantly trying to figure out which one has overstepped their boundaries. Well, the case the court took this year um, is one that I would have thought this boundary had already been set, but apparently this court thinks not. So the court will be considering on uh, November 6th, Town of Greece v. Galloway. Now, Town of Greece v. Galloway is about a town board in the town of Greece. And uh, the town board had observed for many years a moment of silence before they started, right? Wh which is a great way to start a town board meeting. I don't know how many of you have been to any. Uh, I hadn't until I started uh, getting involved in Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, or LUPA. Uh, once I got involved in those cases and I started attending town meetings, I think a moment of silence for about an hour would be really, really good. Um, the only more contentious event I've ever been to was visiting a, a nursing home for, with my mother. Um, <laughs> A lot of opinions in that room. Um, most of them, and I was wrong. So, the, um, so here we have a moment of silence. Well, in 1999, not 1959, not 1969, not even 1979, 1999, the town supervisor came in and he decided that what the board really needed was prayer. So we substituted for the moment of silence a weekly prayer, and, uh, or monthly, I guess it is, a monthly prayer. And so the question, if you're going to have a prayer, is who's delivering it? So to the credit of the town supervisor, uh, they didn't do it themselves. They, they were outsourcing. So what they would do is they would go through the town directory of churches, and they would call and solicit someone to start out the meeting uh, with a prayer, uh, and they just go through the list until they hit on someone who was available. Um, and interestingly, the whole list was Christian. Um, also interestingly, the town supervisor is Catholic and a member of the Knights of Columbus. Just uh, a coincidence, I'm sure. Um, so they sub in prayer, and now they recruit clergy to come in and provide prayers on, uh, at the start of each town board meeting in which there are frequent references to, as you can imagine, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. Two women who attend town board meetings, I don't know why, but <laughs> frequently attend town board meetings, uh, are keeping track of their town just like Americans should, uh, object. 
and they say, the moment of silence was fine, this is unconstitutional, and Americans United for Separation of Church and State take the case. On the other side, on behalf of the town of Greece, uh, is interestingly the Alliance Defense Fund. Now the Alliance Defense Fund is one of the most active uh, litigating groups on behalf of religious groups in the country. Um, for anybody who knows what I do, which is make religious leaders unhappy uh, on a daily basis with respect to child sex abuse, um, I'm always on the other side from the ADF, always. Uh, in fact, I was at an event one time and uh, they had bought a table at this event. And uh, they came over and said, Marcy, come and sit with us. We want to pick your brain. I said, I think that could be like lethal. Uh, and they said, ha, 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 yeah, it could be. Uh, no, I'm not doing it. No. no, I'm not going there. But anyway, so the town is being represented by a group whose mission is to increase religion's presence in the public square. That's a new era. That's a new era. But uh, what's going on here is the test. The test that was created by Justice O'Connor is the endorsement test, and the endorsement test that the government may not endorse religion. Why? Because the government must be neutral with respect to religion. So it can't endorse one religion, it can't endorse religion generally, it is supposed to be neutral with respect to religion. And the courts below held that this was unconstitutional because it was endorsing Christianity. The, the town, and this is why constitutional litigation is so much fun, the town at one point did introduce some diversity. So there were a couple of months where they found a Wiccan priestess, a Baha'i leader, and I'm still puzzling over this, a secular Jew, um, who I suppose started out by saying this isn't religious, it's, but the, the question here is, but by, but by now they're back to full Christian. They, that was just three months. Um, the question here is what is the role of the court in trying to figure out whether or not religion has overstepped its boundaries? Right? What is the role? Now up until now, at least since uh, 1983, when Justice O'Connor joined the uh, court, there has been this concept of endorsement which holds the government back from joining forces with religion by saying a religion's message. But in opposition to that has been a growing voice in the country to say that this is a Christian country. Right? This is a Christian country is the argument that's made. And so we have had this conflict in our public square over the identity of the country where the endorsement test was observing that we have exploding diversity of religious believers, and we do. We have about 100,000 sects in the United States at this point, exploding diversity. Uh, but at the same time, there is a push by uh, very powerful members of the culture that this is a Christian country founded on Christian principles and therefore it's okay for Christianity to be part of government observance. This case is the clash of those two cultures. The concept that, that the government must become increasingly neutral because of diversity, but on the other side, the concept that we need to make sure we don't lose track of the idea that this is a Christian country. And that's what the court is going to be addressing. And of course, what does the court have? You know, we have a common law constitutional system in the sense that our constitutional cases are decided case by case. What do we have in the past? We've got Marsh v. Chambers, which said that legislative prayer at, a, uh, at the state level is okay. It's not a violation of the Constitution. Why? Because it had been in place so many, many years. It was a long tradition. And if there's a long tradition and you still have separation of church and state, it's hard to argue that it's dangerous. 
I mean, that's basically the reasoning of the case. And so Marsh says state legislative prayer is okay, but these local prayer cases are quite different, especially when it's a case like Town of Greece, where they went from the moment of silence, which was clearly constitutional, because it wasn't tied to prayer, and they switched over to a religious observance in 1999, this is going to be a bellwether case. And it's not just about whether or not the town of Greece can have prayer. It's about whether the town of Greece can have just Christian prayer, which is primarily what it's done, and then whether or not the endorsement test, the concept that the government may not endorse religion, is live. So we will wait and see. As you know, we have six Catholics on the Supreme Court at this point from different political persuasions. We'll see if that makes any difference as to whether or not the endorsement test survives. Uh, it's curious they took this case at all. It seems obvious based on existing doctrine that Town of Greece loses, but the fact the court took this case when they're taking very few First Amendment cases is an indicator that they may well uh, have in the back of their minds the idea that they would like to push back against the endorsement test. And we'll see uh, next, in 2014, I'm sure not before then, what the court will do. Let me just close by saying uh, a little thing about our Christian country. We don't have a Christian country. Um, and let me explain that. The country was founded by those escaping Europe uh, and the tyranny of established churches and the cruelty of established churches to minority churches. And they came to the United States to be free of that tyranny in Europe. But for many of them also to set up their own tyranny in their own spot, right? That's the history of the United States. So in Massachusetts, the uh, uh, Congregationalists actually persecuted the Baptists and killed the Quakers, right? We didn't start out as everybody was singing Kumbaya uh, by a long shot. We started out in diversity and strongly felt diversity. Your religion is correct, your religion is wrong, my religion is correct. So in Massachusetts with an established church, it meant that those who disagreed on how baptism was performed had to pay higher taxes and suffer in some instances death. In Pennsylvania, which was you know the land of tolerance uh, with respect to the Quakers, well, you know, there, there, there's that little fact that the Quakers believed that you couldn't force someone to believe the right thing. They had to come to it on their own. That was the major difference between the Quakers and, and the uh, Congregationalists. So, but for the Quakers, because you couldn't force someone to believe uh, successfully, you couldn't mandate that they believe anything in particular but you could still prefer the people who had seen the light. So in Pennsylvania, you couldn't serve in the government in the early years unless you were a Quaker. That's how we started. Plus, of course, the establishments in Maryland and Virginia and in south, southern states. My point is this. We have never, ever had a unified religion. Jewish settlers came here over 350 years ago. They were present at the time of the framing, and, and known, part of the culture. So we don't have a Christian country. What we have is a diverse country that gets more diverse every day in terms of religious belief. And so how the court decides town of Greece will be critical in seeing whether we're headed toward a, a concept of our culture that creates exceptionalism for some religious entities or that pursues this concept of diversity and respect for diversity. 
And it's my view that it's that diversity and respect for diversity that takes you right back to the framers' concept that you fear those who hold power and you fear tyranny and therefore you separate it. Thanks very much. So I guess we have, what, eight minutes? Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on uh, these topics or uh, the child sex abuse crisis in the United States, which I deal with on a daily basis. Any questions? Yes. Anytime. Yes. Right. Uh, the, the reason uh, that I focus on Witherspoon and uh, Princeton uh, is that, of course, James Madison was hugely influential, obviously, but the most framers were educated by any one institution were the ones educated at the College of New Jersey. No other set of framers, there, there may be one or two from other institutions, this is the only one where there are about 11. Uh, and so the way of thinking about constitutionalization was dominated by those concepts at the time. Uh, now, with respect to the Baptists, they coined the phrase separation of church and state. They fundamentally got it. I mean, we now have two Baptist branches, one that thinks separate, that we have a Christian country and one that believes in separation. Um, but uh, they played a, a major role in, in creating the backlash against establishments that then ended establishments. But for purposes of the structure of the Constitution, there, there really is no question that the Calvinists through the Presbyterians and John Witherspoon had an extraordinary impact. Uh, and how do we know more, and I've, I've written about this, I just haven't published this book yet. I need like you know a year to uh, do nothing. Um, if the bishops would behave, I could take off a year, but they're not. <laughs> um, so essentially, uh, what happened is at the very same time that the Constitutional Convention was meeting in Philly uh, for the federal government, it was meeting for the Presbyterian Church. And if you look at the constitutions that were derived for the United States Constitution and the Presbyterian Church, they're quite similar in terms of representative democracy and assumptions about tyranny and, and other aspects. Uh, and what's interesting, I actually wrote, I did write one article in which I said, what's interesting is the longevity and the success of the United States Constitution compared to the Presbyterian Constitution, uh, which is a, a faith that's falling apart. Um, but the key difference was the way in which the United States Constitution hems in the power of those at the top. And the Presbyterian Constitution went toward that, but just didn't close the deal. And so uh, two constitutions being drafted at the same time in the same city, Witherspoon influenced both of them. Very similar concepts. Um, and so that's why, for that moment, I do think that um, the concepts of Calvinism made a difference. But that's it. That's the end, that, you know, the Presbyterians walk out the door just like James Wilson said, I'm done, I'm, I'm leaving. So, uh, but the key that gets translated from the religious precept into the constitutional doctrine is that you don't trust anybody with power. Um, and the dark Calvinist mindset is what was the ground, the fertile ground for that, but it turned in, it's a secular concept at this point in our constitution. Yes. Thank you. 
Well, you know, the, um, the, what's interesting about these cases, the clergy sex abuse cases across the country, is almost none of them ever go to the jury. Uh, as soon as any religious leader or, say, a Penn State executive uh, is going to be deposed, the settlements occur. Uh, I, it's no accident that Penn State is settling uh, all of its claims right before the criminal trials are starting for their three highest executives who are accused of covering up abuse. So, so you really don't get to the jury. But, but I think that your, your question is really, uh, how can we say that a bishop or a rabbi, uh, I just excoriated my own institution, YU, um, thank God for tenure, um, for their lousy uh, handling of these issues. Uh, how can the civil justice system say how they're supposed to supervise? And, and the answer is this. The question is, what's the neutral, generally applicable law? What is the, the law that's being applied? It's tort law, and the question is, is the institution being negligent with respect to the protection of children? And we've set a baseline that institutions can't endanger children uh, unnecessarily. And so if that's your baseline, the, the question is not whether or not the bishop followed their beliefs or the rabbi followed his beliefs in dealing with the situation. The question is whether or not whatever steps they took endangered children. And if they did, they get the same treatment under the law as do the daycare centers and the public schools. So uh, really, you know, if, I, if I'd given a, a lecture on the free exercise clause, uh, I would have explained how the, the free exercise clause of the First Amendment creates a, a doctrine and a system where the government must enact neutral, generally applicable laws, and these tort laws in these cases are the prime example. The only, the only displeasure I have in events like this is playing the role I play right now, which is uh, recognizing that uh, we, we need to leave this room so that other activities can take place. But I ask you all to uh, put your hands together and thank <laughs> Professor Hamilton for the wonderful hour. Thank you.